We're about uh, 50 people right now. Um, it varies this year because of the uh, situation that we're in. Uh, we are on a fairly rapid growth trajectory starting for 2021, so we're extremely pleased with that. And uh, we have some machine times, so and we're looking for some more business. <laughs> Now, didn't you guys recently uh, expand and uh, build a new, uh, you know, uh, facility? That is correct. Um, we just recently built out another 6,700 square feet of uh, clean room space. Right now, it's rated at class 100,000. Um, we have the capability of rating that down to class 10,000 if necessary. Uh, right now, the processing that's being done in that building, it's not necessary for it to be the, quite that uh robust as far as the clean room design is concerned. Um, but if the right project comes along, we'll recertify the clean room and uh, move forward with the project. All right, awesome. And um, Julian, uh, tell us a little bit about your background as the uh, thermoplastic extrusion manager. All right, hello everybody. My name is Julian Schallhorn. I am the milk thermoplastic manager and um, I'm originally a California transplant. I've been out in Arizona for eight years and have been extruding here in Arizona for seven years. So we have multiple different projects that I've um, taken the lead on and um, I enjoy um, the challenging aspect of some of the projects we've worked on. And how did you get into thermoplastic extrusions? Oh, um, I think we offered it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then we trained him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I had um, a Toyota production experience with a lot of the Kaizen and uh, a lot of the experience I took from that job, some of it was able to translate into a production here. Mm -hmm. um, but that was my route was in um, uh, production for Toyota. But then uh, Tony offered me a job and I, um, you know, I took it and I've been rocking ever since, been knocking it out the park. All right, awesome, awesome. So uh, basically let's uh, talk a little bit about, uh, cause I know that you know, people wanna know how they can reduce the costs of their thermoplastic extrusions. And we're gonna get into a lot of that kind of stuff here. And um, so what, um, uh, you know, we know that, uh, you know, IPE is, it has been, you know, pretty much best known for EPTFE extrusions and a lot of clean room extrusions and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, everything from, uh, you know, uh, extruding uh, EPTFE, uh, you know, and PTFE sutures all the way up through, um, you know, tubes, rods, uh, and, um, and sheets. So, you know, how did uh, you guys get involved with the thermoplastic extrusions and, um, you know, how long have you been doing it? I'll take that one. So <clears throat> the, we purchased our first melt thermoplastic extruder it was 1992 or 1993, I don't recall the exact date. Um, and basically what we were doing at that point in time was single lumen, small diameter tubing for the telecommunications industry. Um, as the company grew, we began to see a need for uh, marrying the melt thermoplastic materials together with the, um, with the porous PTFE that we produce here. And so what, we, what we've got is a situation where we can take the porous PTFE, we can reflow a, uh, say, let's say a nylon or, a, uh, or an FEP tube onto the end of this porous PTFE. And we've gotten uh, fairly large projects associated with that, um, mainly for catheter applications and, um, and robotic surgical applications. Now, um, as far as uh, most of the melt thermoplastic projects that we've worked on, a lot of them have been not simply just a plain tube. Um, in the early 2000s, we worked on an inhalation device, which is basically a pump, had a polyurethane tube with basically three or four features on it. Both ends were uh, expanded to an accept a, a, a lure connector. And then in the middle was a curly cue that had to be in, a, in the perfect spot so it didn't interfere with the pumping mechanism on the delivery device. Um, those are just some of the, some of the larger projects of, that we've worked on um, in, the, in recent, recent years. All right, and uh, so in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, redu cost reductions and that kind of thing, I mean, you know, what, what are the, uh, you know, what are the key elements? What are like the three to five key elements that go into, um, you know, thermoplastic extrusions and that determine the cost of, 
what the final extrusion is going to end up being? Well, one of the one of the key issues is being able to prototype with a less expensive material. And we've seen some success with that where we'll test our dye design, we'll test our, uh, our flow rates with a material that might be similar, but it might not have all of the um, all of the compounds in it. So, so if we're looking for fire retardancy or if we're looking for um, maybe uh, being able to see it under x-ray, mm -hmm. uh, we might extrude with the base material in order to get the tooling geometry correct if, it's, if for some reason it's a, a profile or something along those lines. Normally a tube, unless it's a very thin wall and a very large diameter, is a, is a slam dunk for us. Um, Larger tubing like that can be a challenge. Uh, we've mastered uh, mastered that up to about six hundred and seventy five thousands, and so um, and that's uh, I, think, I believe that was a PBAC project. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Julian was uh, uh, challenged with that particular project and and came out like a rock star. So that thing worked really well. Well, I mean, on that subject, I mean, tell me, Julian, tell me a little bit about that project. What were the, what some of the challenges you, you know, you ran into and, and overcame to, you know, make sure that the customer was uh, well taken care of? Well, the, it, had, it, was thin, it was pretty thin, but, um, and we're running this hot molten material through a vacuum and we're trying to blow it up at the same time. So we have to be, be mindful of the surface area because we want it to be flawless. We want to try our best to make it look presentable. So we ha you have to worry about the, getting the perfect OD, the, the, thin, the wall has to be perfect and has to be visually, visually acceptable. Yeah, so you can, it does take a little time. I mean, especially if it's the first time we're doing it, but um, we, we will not give up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, so. let's address the, uh, the cost reduction side of that. Um, basically what we're doing is we're looking at um, putting together a project that has uh, uh, a specific plan. And instead of just um, throwing some tooling together and uh, making the machine do what we want it to do, we'll, we'll do the calculations. If for some reason we've got extra features to add, We'll get in our engineering group in, involved. Um, and we're always looking at some way to control cost. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can control cost at our, on our end, we can pass that, uh, that savings on to our customers. And that's always been our goal and our, uh, uh, one of our main uh, aspects of manufacturing here. Uh, a lot of the materials that we extrude around here are We've, we've done so many projects, we've got probably a piece of this and a piece of uh, 10 pounds of this, 15 pounds of that laying around. And so we can prototype rather rapidly. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when uh, somebody's developing a catheter, they might just need something quick, meaning um, don't care what kind of material it is, I just need to do proof of concept on pushability or placeability or, uh, or something, along those, uh, something along those lines. And so with our, um, with our inventory, we'll usually be able to knock something out fairly quickly. Now it won't be a whole lot of parts, but, right. um, but uh, we can get you something in, in a fairly rapid manner. Got it. And um, so now in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, basically from what, uh, you know, I mean, you know, what part does uh, the equipment, the type of equipment play overall in the overall scheme of, uh, cost for your thermoplastic extrusions? I'm going to take part of that. We, um, and then I'm going to let you finish. Mm -hmm. So we, in 2015, we purchased a state-of-the-art machine from American Coon. Um, it came with three barrels. We've got a one inch, an inch and a quarter, and an inch and a half. So we've got um, quite a bit of capacity there. Um, it also came with updated software from our 1992 machine that we had simply worn out. Um, and I want to let Julian address some of the challenge that we had with the older machine and some of the features that we have with the new machine that uh, helps us achieve that cost reduction goal that's um, key to everybody um, ordering our products. 
Yeah, so with the old machine, it was old, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, things start to uh, break down eventually. And it does, it may take longer time to do R&D on a part when we um, have fluctuation in the, in the size of the, of the part. But with this new machine, it's, uh, it's a lot more uh, easier to make these parts. Um, it's more reliable and we, we um, our zoom box is uh, great. For, and it tells us we get so many different readings. Like yeah, I mean, we can set it up to, um, as we're about to start collecting or in the middle of a project, if the size does fluctuate, um, it will kick off um, bad parts mm -hmm. continuously and, and alarm us. Oh, we can make adjustments in order to bring the, the process back under control. Yeah, right. and, and you can do it automatically too. And so we can set it up so that way the machine will make adjustments automatically. If it does go out of spec, it will adjust. So it's once everything's dialed in to set up in the manufacturing part, if we could just make parts all day long. And if any issues that arise, either the, the machine would do it automatically or the, or the, or the um, in, person in it is watching the part can make adjustments too. So, but it's, so, the, so it's also, and then I'm assuming also it, it, it'll keep your uh, tolerances a lot tighter and, and allow yes, you to yes. make more complex parts. Yes, yes, yes that is correct. Got it. Um, now, what about, um, uh, you know, uh, now we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, what, what are, what are some of the limitations that you guys have in terms of, uh, uh, die size and, and that kind of thing. And in terms of, I mean, when you're talking about in, in general, um, extrusions, um, you know, cause I know that some places, you know, I mean, you know, some places you're talking about gigantic extrusions, you know, you're talking, um, you know, 10, 12 inch, whatever size extrusions. And you guys specialize in much smaller uh, diameter extrusions, right? Much smaller, very precise uh, extrusions. Currently, we're only a single layer design with the exception of overcoating materials. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a setup for doing that. So we can lay down two layers. It's just not ideal at this point. Um, we do have some projects in the works right now where we would be uh, looking at a microtruder in order to introduce a very thin layer over the outside of another material. So we would have a two layer design at that point. That project probably won't mature for about eight months. Mm -hmm. And so we won't have that capability for, you know, some time uh, in the future. But those are some of the growth opportunities that we're looking at. Now, as far as the tooling is concerned, um, we have our own machine shop here so that if it's a, uh, it's a fairly, uh, simple material or a simple setup, we can go back and if we need to uh, pour a few thousands out of the die or, or build a new mandrel rather quickly, we can have that done in usually a day, a couple of days max, unless if we don't have the material in place. Mm -hmm. So um, that, uh, that helps us translate into quicker turnaround, which should reduce cost on the other end of the uh, diet. So, I mean, basically in, in some of our discussions, we decided, you know, we, we kind of came down to three key elements that are, um, that really determine uh, the largest factors in terms of uh, cost reduction. And those elements are part design or data collection, you know, getting information from the customer about the specific project that they're looking for. And then of course, there's also uh, the material choice and specifications for that. And then the third element is also the tooling. So uh, I wanted to kind of delve into the first part, which is, you know, part design or, and data collection from the customer. Um, you know, and we know that, you know, uh, communication is one of the key factors here in the, in the process when you're trying to develop a new part for a customer. Um, and, you know, before we go into the part design, you know, I mean, what are some of the key things that you need to find out from the customer in the early phases um, of the project so that you can work with them to, uh, you know, to help guide them? Well, yeah, if, if there is uh, the tolerance, um, how tight the tolerances need to be. And or would they be willing to, if there's any issues in the future, if we go in production, would they be willing to open up tolerances? That would definitely let us know what um, what we can do. Um, It'll help us to reduce the um, 
any type of waste that we yeah. have, again, that reduces the cost of the overall project. Um, so that's what, for when it comes to the part aspect of it, yes, the um, tolerances, and then we have the material too. If there's a history, if they have feedback from, if, if there's a history with the material that they're, they're recommend, recommending, then um, that would definitely help us out. You know, if we know, um, any information we can get on the material would definitely help us out for the, uh, how we're going to set up the, the job. Got it. Just to kind of readdress that a little bit, the um, we we have a lot of specialty materials around there, like peak and um, and Ketaspire or what Ketaspire? What is the other yeah, right. um, yeah. Ketaspire. And, and, uh, and anyway, um, those are highly specialized materials, and they're they're quite expensive. And so when I, I when we get back to this tool design, this die design. We'll, we'll do dry runs with a lot less expensive material. Mm -hmm. And again, that helps us to prove, do our proof of concept and then allows us to move forward. Got it. Now, what about environmental factors? And, um, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, of course, ge part geometry and that kind of thing. I mean, how does that play and strength requirements? I mean, how does all that stuff play into the, to the cost? Well, part geometry can be a challenge if it's, especially if it's a, um, a, uh, thin wall a crazy profile. Yeah, thin wall, or like Julian said, crazy profile. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've had some challenging um, profiles, and um, but uh, we've been able to uh, take it, knock it out the park and uh, make some good looking profiles. Even though it seems complicated at first, but um, we have a good team, mm -hmm. and um, we can we can take care of some uh, complex profiles as long as it's. We've got one that's a rather interesting um, profile. It looks like a, uh, there's a little part that goes into it that looks like a tiny surfboard. Mm -hmm. um, and that part is an introducer for a, um, for a facelift device. Mm -hmm. And it's a uh, bioabsorbable. So the material is cut in an angle and it's burnished on the end. Um, and it looks like an upside down W um, wow. when you look at it. And it's simply for placing the uh, the medical product or the, the bioabsorbable um, somewhere in the facial area, and then uh, pulled up for the facelift, and then it uh, slowly absorbs into the body. Got it. Now that, was, that one was rather complicated. So when we're talking about you know the actual design of the parts, and you're talking to an engineer about their design, I mean, you know, obviously you're looking at the complexity of it, and, and do you? Are there typical, um, I don't know, for lack of a better term, common mistakes or issues that you kind of see over and over again that engineers and designers are putting into their parts where you could help them to, um, you know, if they, if they looked at it a different way or if they, you know, did something different that you could help them to reduce the cost of their uh, part? I, you know what? It kind of goes back to tolerances. Um, one of the <clears throat> one of the biggest challenges that we have is that um, we might be building a catheter that that then goes into some type of introduction device. And there's only a certain amount of real estate there, so the buildup of tolerance um, for all of the parts that might go into that tube uh, dictates the size of the part that they, that might be necessary from our facility. And so having, having to address that, find out what kind of real estate's available um, and, and, and negotiate with the engineering group to see if we can't either minimize our effect on that particular aspect of the device or, um, you know, or tighten our tolerances up. If we need mm -hmm. to pull things within a thousands or even a half a thousands in some, in, with some projects, we can do so. Um, you know, a lot of these uh, newer catheters have a lot of moving parts. Um, some of them have electrodes that go down through them. Some of them, um, you know, so let's take something like uh, an example of an endoscope. Right. There's probably 30 parts that go down to the tip of that thing in order to steer it, show light, wash off the, wash off the camera, uh, biopsy channels, things of that nature. So, um, you know, our job is to work within the constraints of the engineering group's goals and objectives. And then at some point, um, if we can get 
we can get a little extra tolerance in there, we're, we're always looking for that. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, now do you find that sometimes things are, uh, some of the tolerances are just overkill for the application? We've seen that in some of the projects where, um, you know, there might be a part that is maybe of a softer material, say like a, like a thermoset or a thermoplastic uh, elastomer, something along mm -hmm. those lines. And you might see an incredible tolerance of plus or minus a half thousandths on something like that. When you actually measure that part, your measurement technique will actually take up most of your tolerance. Um, and so when we do gauge R&R &R on some of the projects, we'll have to point that out to the engineering team stating that, hey, you know what, we can meet the tolerances, but our measurement technique is taking up the entire tolerance. Mm -hmm. So um, we want to make sure that everybody's aware of that, you know, going in because there, there's a, there's always a transfer between the engineering team and then the production side, right? The research and development engineering team, you know, they get all the details worked out. We get the parts built the way that they wish to have them built with the correct tolerancing and um, you know, the correct configuration. And then it goes to purchasing and production. Um, and what that means is that there's an extra quality step that gets in the middle of that, that uh, then during the verification process on, on the customer side, you know, they're looking, they might be looking at different aspects of the part different from what an engineer might look at it. Got it. And so we'll, we'll have to sit down and talk about how we would measure those parts how we get to the C equals zero, um, you know, part distribution so that we have no rejects uh, going out of our facility and into somebody else's facility. And if there is a, if there is an issue, how to mitigate that issue and change it so that those issues don't occur again. Um, our quality system's been designed uh, to, uh, to robustly track that and then provide feedback to the customer um, in order to, uh, to address any issues that they might have in their quality systems. Okay. So now let's move on. Um, you know, I mean, unless you guys, do you guys, are there any other issues, uh, in the design or, um, you know, data collection phase that you, that we haven't discussed yet to, you know, not that I'm aware of, um, what we're seeing is with, uh, with the engineering groups that we're dealing with these days, uh, everybody's done one or two. It's when we see the junior engineers that they, they, we might need to coach them a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the engineering groups that we work with these days are well-versed in catheter building and, uh, and you know, tolerancing and buildup of tolerancing with the, with the different parts that are associated with the project. Got it. Well, so let's talk, uh, let's delve into the next uh, part, which is uh, <clears throat> materials here. Um, and, you know, how do, how do materials factor in the, uh, you know, uh, cost equation? We know that it's not only having to do with the hard cost of the material. There's other things that uh, come into play. And, uh, you know, so what are some of those things in terms of the type of material that you're selecting for the particular product that it will also affect the cost? Well, this is so for a medical part or yeah. two. Um, so obviously, if it is medical, then the, the cost will definitely go up for that for that material. But for production or for R and D, like Tony said mentioned earlier, it doesn't have to be. We can find something very similar, like a low density polyethylene that that doesn't have to be medical grade to to, to make the tube, just to do the R and D aspect of it, and then we can transition to a medical grade low density polyethylene and then make that too. The difference is uh, won't be noticeable for, 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 for a manufacturing part of it mm -hmm. or even the tooling. So we, if we go in with a project and want and you want it to be um, medical grade, we have experience, we have uh, other materials that we can use instead of that out the gate. That'll definitely um, help uh, the price list for that the beginning aspect of it, a little bit R&D uh, phase of it. Yeah. A couple of other factors too, especially when you get into the high-end engineering resins that have, uh, you know, the, the steel-like properties. Um, you know, we'll want to make sure that 
were in pretty good shape before we start extruding something that cost a hundred dollars a pound because yeah. mm -hmm. um, waste then becomes a huge factor in the cost of production of the materials um, you know and, the, and once we've quoted something we stick to that so we will do everything in our power to reduce the costs on our side if for some reason we've misquoted um, which doesn't happen often Got it. materials too we have we have so much history um, with uh, different materials, so we can draw on our experience to make sure we have the uh, right tooling, uh, the right heat for, for the project, you know. So we have history and a, a large database to go off of to help us um, uh, work, work the problem out or this uh, work, work the project. I still have the copy of PHR 00001. <laughs> Um, now, do you guys, um, have you guys found typically that, uh, you know, uh, materials that are specified in a project, uh, you know, are overkill for the application? And if so, uh, how often does that happen? And can you give any examples of how you solved it? It doesn't happen that often. Um, a, lot, a lot of times, um, we'll have an engineer access, they'll be broad and uh, the materials that they're interested in. Um, but there, there are some occasions that uh, that does happen every once in a while that um, somebody would recommend specific material and we can recommend something that would work that would work just fine that is cheaper. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it's easy, easier to get a hold of. Yeah. Um, we've run into a couple of projects in the past um, especially when there was the uh, ethylene crunch of 2017. I mean, that might have been 16, translating into 17. Um, we were having a tough time getting resins. And so at that point, uh, we did make some recommendations to some of our customers to equivalent grades or equivalent uh, um, uh, formulations from different companies in order to move forward. The only, the only issue with doing something like that is then that, that uh, it's a medical company they have to refile with FDA that can take a while and usually well what happened in 2017 is that the uh, we, we uh, made it by the skin of our teeth and the resin supplies began to flow again um, so those are those are some of the challenges that we've seen in the past mm -hmm. uh, again that probably doesn't translate to cost savings especially from a from a customer standpoint but we're here to make sure that the customer gets the parts that they need and at some point, at some, in some cases, you're kind of doing everything possible in order to get the parts that you need or that the customer may need. And you may not be focused specifically on cost reduction at that point. But those are project by project uh, issues that come up from time to time. Uh, and we don't anticipate that happening in the future. Hopefully not anyway. Got it. Now, what about uh, material characteristics and secondary processing? I mean, how does that come into play? And, you know, uh, and, and, and what about, you know, in, in, in terms of, you know, pliability versus non-pliability and those types of issues? Well, as far as um, the materials are concerned, we, um, we, we've seen uh, secondary processing where we've either tried to put a, not tried, or we either put a tip on it or put a bulb on it, um, or we've welded a couple of materials together. Um, that seems to be something that's quite popular these days is where you've got uh, uh, one material is your base material and then another material that might go over the top of that in order to create an actual stop um, if it's being passed over an instrument or something along those lines. Um, and also can work for the ID as well, where a material might be being used as a uh, protective sheath and you need a positive stop. So you would marry the two materials together. Got it. And what about uh, bat, uh, you know, I mean, are there, uh, are there any um, batch to batch uh, consistency issues uh, these days or, uh, you know, material availability and, uh, you know, uh, quantities uh, are any of those things a factor at all today this, this year we haven't seen that as being an issue um, we've seen it in years past as being an issue um, in as far as quantities are concerned usually when we get a, a fairly large project we'll order a gaylord of material 
And in the past, that's been sort of a challenge because we've seen from one batch to the next parameters change in order to get the same run characteristics associated with the with the tubing that's or the tubing or the profile that's uh, that's being extruded. Mm -hmm. With the vendors we're using these days, we don't see that much batch to batch variability. There's still some, but it's not like it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago where you get one batch in and then the parameters will completely change from the next batch. So I don't know if that's uh, um, a, uh, a result of attrition in the marketplace or whether or not the engineering groups have gotten better at building plastics themselves. <laughs> I suspect it's probably the latter mm -hmm. in that, uh, you know, people are understanding the chemistry a little better. They're understanding uh, how to control the process a little better. And, you know, we've got these things called computers that can do a million calculations a second. So <laughs> or probably more than that. And uh, those guys are, those guys are producing some good stuff for us these days. Got it. Now, do you guys run into, uh, you know, many issues about the material waste? And I mean, how does that play into, uh, you know, obviously the more material you're wasting, the, the, the higher the cost costs, goes up. Yeah. So. You, you might see that in the R&D phase, but you won't see that in the production phase. Yeah, once we go to production, we pretty much uh, have a lockdown. Um, and then, like we mentioned before, um, if it's, it's a, that happens, we can use a cheaper material sometimes, you know, yeah. and sometimes we can get away with using the cheaper material and that definitely helps uh, cost savings, right? But um, but if, if, if you're not able to do that, um, yeah, there might be some at the beginning of the R&D process, but usually once we, once we have it dialed in, we're good. Yeah, loss is very, or waste is very minimal. Um, Toyota, Toyota, you mean? That's a Toyota <laughs> production. It mean, no waste. We can't yeah. waste anything. Um, so, lastly, in, in terms of this, to wrap this part up, uh, you know, because I know Tony, we were talking about your spool recycling program, and uh, just wanted to kind of, you know, how does that work, um, and how does that save the customer money? Well, so what we've done with some of our customers is we've implemented a uh, a system by where. We'll ship materials out on spools to them. They'll collect those spools over time and then they'll ship them back. Um, as long as that's appropriate for their particular process, uh, we have a method by which we can take care of that, get the, get the spools back in here, get them cleaned up. And if they need clean, toss out the ones that might have a chip or something in them and, uh, and recycle those back to either that customer or another customer that we've entered into a supply agreement that allows us to do that. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of brings up an interesting point is that uh, we do enter into supply agreements with our customers in order to define, you know, whose role, what role each one of us has in making sure that the parts that come to uh, not only our facility, but to their facility uh, meet the specifications of both of us. Mm -hmm. That way it's more of a partnership rather than a challenge in order to get parts out to the customer on a, on a regular basis. Got it. Um, all right, well, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, tooling then, uh, which is uh, one of the last uh, keys. Um, you know, what factors should customers look at when they're designing tooling and when they're, you know, purchasing tooling for their extrusion? Well, you need to look at um, flow characteristics of plastics. If, mm -hmm. uh, if for some reason the, the um, you might have an oval with a bulb on the end or something like that, we've seen strange designs like that before. Um, with no explanation as to why that bulb needed to be there. That's a huge challenge for us, not only from a tooling design aspect, but from a flow characteristic aspect. Um, we've been able to achieve that by, you know, making dams and things like that in the, uh, in the helicoid and, and changing the flow characteristics of the plastic. It's not something that we typically want to do, but, you know, stranger designs uh, usually create um, a little bit of an interesting project. And once we get one of those, then we try to negotiate a situation where we can design the tool around a, uh, uh, around a, an equal flow of, pro of product coming out of the die. Mm -hmm. Meaning we, we don't have high pressure spots or low pressure spots um, or even uh, voids where we wouldn't get plastic to flow. Got it. 
So, so then, of course, and that also comes back to the first part, which is, uh, you know, communication between you and the, and the customer yeah. right at the beginning in terms of data collection and finding out, well, you know, why is the bulb in there? So that way you can help them to address that issue if it right. needs to be there or not. And maybe, it's a, maybe it's an issue with reinforcement. Right. And you know, uh, maybe we can put a wire in the wall or something like that. So, uh, so there's, uh, you know, there's those, those things that, uh, you know, help with the communication. Um, now, in, in, you know, is it better for the customer to provide, to get the tooling done independently of your shop? Or is it better for them to um, have you guys just take care of the tooling or have any shop take care of the tooling? Uh, you know, I mean, if they're going to, depending on which extruder they end up going to, is it better to just have them do the one, do it all, or to have it separate? It's better if uh, we take care of that aspect of it. And um, um, and what's happened in the, in the past is uh, we've you know worked on projects when uh, we've had to open up. Um, we've on some profiles we've um, um, had some issues with the part, and we're trying to figure out what's going on, we'll be able to communicate with our engineers in the back, come up with a plan, and uh, we'll make a few changes to the tuning that we uh, that we have on hand, knock it out to park. So the fact that we have uh, a, a great set of guys in the back that can help us out with tooling, um, helps us out a lot, time, and um, stress. <laughs> so those, those guys, those guys are really cool in the back. So definitely we, um, that, we, do, we do that in-house, we can communicate with each other and work it together as a team to knock it out. So that's what uh, I guess best best that we take on the responsibility of the tooling here. Got it. Um, and, and, and I mean, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the tooling and, uh, you know, what about, you know, how many iterations does it usually take to get the dies and the parts done right for a project? What should customers expect in that regard? Well, with a with a complicated profile, it can take up to three times in order to get the um, get the, the geometry correct. Um, and like I mentioned uh, before, you might have a void where you're not getting the, the correct uh, plastic flow or, or material flow into an area, um, and so you might have to do some modifications on the back end to get better flow in that area. Mm -hmm. You can change the you know the design of the blunt mandrel. You can change uh, you can change the die characteristics itself, uh, there and um, and provide a better flow rate in the, in those areas where you're having a tough time getting the, the correct wall or something along those lines. We make some really neat bumpers for uh, for um, uh, circuit boards so that when they're going through their process, when they bounce off, off of each other. They're bouncing off of our little uh, our little bumper, and uh, that seems to to uh, that that one was quite the challenge to build. Mm -hmm. and it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was, at first, it was a little frustrating, but you know what? I mean, working together with the guys in the back, it was like it was pretty cool the way we knocked it out, and um, it was really interesting. I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed yeah. that. That one that one was a neat project, and now it just run. You just set it up, and it runs. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, long as it's not overly for tooling, the longest is um not overly complex. Mm -hmm. Um, if we can, uh, it can be done. Yeah, I mean, the part, picture a uh, uh, gosh, what was that? Uh, it picture a square top with some legs on the bottom. That's Got basically it. what it looks like. Now what, ab the top. now, what about uh, you know, lead times on getting tooling made and uh, the, the run life of a set of tooling? Well, as far as getting uh, tooling made, as long as it's a, a round profile or even um, something that we could mill here, uh, we can we can build that here in house. Anything that has to be EDM, we have to send that out. So we're at the mercy of our vendors at that point. Yeah. Right now, things are running around four weeks for delivery. Um, we've seen them as quick as a week and a half. Uh, it all depends on what type of materials are being run at some of the machine shops that we use for EDM work. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the lead times are bumping back up, so we're we're usually under the gun uh, in order to get parts out the door once we get the tooling back um, as the lead times increase from our vendors. We, for two for two, we can gun pretty quick. We've gotten 
Oh, you did that in the day. Yeah, knocked it out <laughs> really quick. Um, but the profiles, EDM stuff takes a while. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, tell me what this, uh, what the two is one and one is none concept is. That but, feels good. <laughs> <laughs> so, during production, you can you can run into problems, and if you have um, an issue with a set of tooling, it's always nice to be able to fall back on another set. Um, for especially if right if you're right in the middle of a project that's hot, um, so it's, I, I always think it's best to have another set of tooling to fall back on that, so we can just get it up and going and um, and keep the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be stuck waiting for. A, a new part to be designed, especially if the guys were, or if they're backed up in the back in the house, right? Wait a little bit, or even um, and for getting something EDM, that could be a while. So I always recommend we have two sets of tooling. So that basically is that that's a really good, I mean, for especially for longer production runs and that kind of thing, that's a really good stopgap measure to make, you know, kind of like it's like buying insurance essentially. Exactly. You know? yeah. And uh, so now, um, you know, we're coming to the end of our, uh, our, our time here. Um, but I wanted to kind of get into, you know, some of the other factors that may, you know, come into consideration to reduce costs of the, uh, you know, of the extrusions. I mean, you know, uh, what about, um, uh, you know, we're talking about part volumes and, uh, you know, talking about, you uh, you know, material quantities and, uh, you know, Kanban, part availability, lead times. I mean, just in general, you know, what are some of those things that that all, you know, just kind of play into that? You mentioned a whole series of, um, of cost reduction measures that, that can be achieved, uh, again, through, through supply agreements and, and things of that nature. Um, we do enter into Kanban agreements where we'll keep a certain amount of parts here on our shelves mm -hmm. um, so that if the volumes ebb and flow, so to speak, uh, we have some safety stock available. Um, we also have some stock available. If for some reason, somebody runs into a situation where they receive a rather large order and we need to get something out the door right away. Got it. Um, uh, as far as material material volumes are concerned, you know, it, we like to right size that, maybe keep uh, uh, three to six months supply on hand, depending on what type of material it is. Mm -hmm. That way we can um, set up a system where we've got plenty of material available. We get the, the volume discount on the, uh, on the pricing um, and things of that nature. So. Got it. Okay. So um, I got a couple of other uh, questions here from uh, uh, some of our participants. Uh, okay. One is, um, uh, question one is, you know, by referring to plastic flow characteristics, do you mean the manufacturer mainly in the fluoropolymers or mainly of the fluoropolymers in terms of the, um, you know, plastic flow characteristics? We've done some work with that in the past, but no, mainly the product, uh, the, the plastic flow characteristics of melt thermoplastics, things that you can heat up in temperature um, and, and, and basically change their shape by just increasing the heat. Uh, PTFE, or, or at least um, the uh, PTFE that we extrude here is a paste extrusion. We have done some ETFEs and some PFAs. Um, those are also those are the melt side of the uh, thermal of the uh, of the um, PTFP type materials, and you know we we've, we've got experience with those, and some of them are quite expensive. Mm -hmm. but we ran one the other day that was one hundred and three dollars a pound or something like that. Um, we didn't we didn't waste any of that. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your experience with higher reduction ratios or lower? Uh, you know, I mean, or, 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 or I'm assuming the question was, you know, your experience uh, uh, for, uh, you know, in higher reduction ratios or, or is it, or is it lower for fluoropolymer? Well, it kind of depends on the tubing that you're trying to extrude. Um, if we're talking a paste extrusion, the paste extrusion is, uh, 
We've got a certain reduction ratio that, uh, range that we work within. We've pushed that envelope with different materials. Um, and so anything is possible with enough engineering time and patience. Um, what we've seen is that with the, uh, with the uh, melt thermoplastic extrusion side, that's one of the reasons that we have three barrels in one machine. Um, if, if we need something to, uh, if we need to build something that, uh, uh, you know, that, that has a high reduction ratio from, a, um, from like a FEP or a PFA standpoint, uh, we'll use a larger barrel because that'll require a larger drawdown. Got it, okay. And um, so, you know, real, uh, you know, quickly in, in review, I mean, basically we've got, uh, you know, when, when we're talking about cost reduction or, or, you know, being able to identify any of those factors, obviously the number one thing is as early in the process of your project, you want to get in touch with your vendor to coordinate with them to start the discussions about, uh, you know, about the, about the project and, and uh, what can and can't be done and, uh, and to get as much input from you as possible. Uh, and that was, you know, one of the takeaways. Another uh, takeaway that um, I also, uh, you know, gather obviously is, uh, you know, I mean, it seems as though most of it, most of the cost reductions occur in the R&D phase, correct? That is correct, yes. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges that we run into when we're trying to quote a project is that um, we'll get, we'll get some outrageous number where, the, where we're gonna build 4 million units, um, and, which is not a problem with the exception as if it doesn't mature correctly. Mm -hmm. So um, what we'll try to do is we'll try to right size the project so that we get, and I kind of alluded to this in the materials section, but try to right size the project so that we get the best discount that we can get from a resident supply standpoint so that we can pass those savings on to our customers. Got it. And, um, you know, so obviously that's all a, a key. And now if, you know, what factors should uh, the, your customer um, or, you know, engineering engineers and whatnot, what, what are the things that they should really watch for when they're trying to find um, a thermoplastic extruder? Well, on-time delivery is a big one. Um, the ability to sort of react on the fly is another. Um, we have multiple projects coming through the facility these days that require um, that changes be made almost instantaneously. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, we're relying on vendors that don't allow us to do that. That's why uh, we've tried to integrate both the porous PTFE manufacturing, PTFE manufacturing, and the melt thermoplastic manufacturing all integrated into one facility, <clears throat> excuse me, one facility. Um, one of the, and, and I kind of lost track of the, uh, the question there, but uh, my point being is that we're kind of a one-stop shop for, for building machine machinery and equipment as well as um, materials. What I mean by machinery and equipment, for some reason it needs a bulb on the end or it needs to be tipped in some fashion. We can actually build a machine here that will do that in our machine shop. Got it. So basically then um, if you're looking for a, you know, a company to run thermoplastic extrusions for you, then what you, you know, then, then certainly in-house capabilities is definitely a, a factor, correct? Yes, that is correct. And, um, and in terms of, uh, you know, and, and problem solving and upfront communication as well, right? That is correct. Uh, the, the best way to do projects is, especially if it's a rather large one, is get everybody in a room together, at least in the beginning, mm -hmm. and then fan out to the different, um, uh, <clears throat> the different engineering um, disciplines in order to get the correct uh, materials. Got it. Um, here's another uh, question uh, that popped up. Uh, would you agree that higher shrink ratios of heat shrink tubes in FEP tube uh, uh, using a higher uh, 
I think that's MFL. Milk mm -hmm. flow rate, yep. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, uh, un unfortunately, I'm not well versed in heat shrink tubing because we don't make any of that here. <laughs> okay, got it. Uh, we use it. Um, and we've seen what I, uh, we can kind of go into some of the challenges that we've seen with uh, with um, heat shrink tubing. One of the biggest challenges that we see is the fact that uh, if the wall is not uh, perfectly concentric, we can see different shrink ratios on different sides of the tubes, mm -hmm. which in some cases throw one side of the tube out of tolerance and the other side will be intolerance if we're, for instance, reflowing it onto another part. Oh, okay. So that's one of the biggest challenges that we've seen. I would like to be able to build my own uh, heat shrink tubing. We're not quite there yet. Got it. <clears throat> All right. Um, okay, well, I think that, uh, you know, uh, basically, um, you know, we've gone over pretty much everything, the key elements being data collection, main, area up front, you know, communication with the engineer, really getting all the specs under control, finding out what they are, how it uh, relates to uh, the materials that are going to be uh, used in the end product. If, if, you, yes. if there's going to be enough material available and what the specifications of that material are, and if you can, uh, you know, possibly find something else that's going to work just as well for whatever the specs are to the uh, with the customer. And then of course, always making sure that whoever's doing your thermoplastic extrusions is actually the one that's also taking care of the tooling as well. Um, and in the case of larger production runs, having uh, multiple sets of tooling to be able to uh, uh, work with that. Uh, yes. And uh, let's see. Uh, Ah, okay, here's another, here's a comment. Uh, our experience is that we use three melt flow indexes for lower shrink ratios and 36 melt flow index for two to one shrink ratio. Um, and he wants to know what your comments are on that. Well, there's a limit to what, our, what we can handle for our melt flow rate. Usually anything above 22 is proven to be extremely difficult for us to extrude on our end. It's just, we could throw like seven, eight, 10 screen packs at something that um, that has a 20 or, or a 22 melt flow rate. Mm -hmm. When you get up to the 30 or 36, we don't, we, there's nothing really, really we can make with that. Maybe we can code something with that on our end, but when it comes to making a tube or anything that has a higher melt flow rate, it won't, it's just liquid. It's just, it's just we have we can't produce anything. We haven't produced anything. Uh, with that high melt flow rate. Got it. So now is that, is it, are there extruders that, that will produce the uh, things with that kind of a, a melt flow rate or is that kind of outside of the general scope of most extruders? I, to be honest with you, I don't know how to answer that. For, for our end, for our end, we've had difficulty um, extruding uh, um, material that has a very high melt flow rate. Yep. I know with uh, Delrin. Delrin was an extremely challenging material to extrude. We were able to extrude it finally, um, but it was extremely challenging to get to where we needed to be uh, with that particular project. Got it. All right. Yeah. And they, the uh, uh, questioner said basically they use it for cable and tube uh, for IV canola, canola in India. So that's Got where it. they're, that's how they're using it. Okay. Yeah. That's, it would be some type of a coating material more than likely. Yeah, I don't think it's a free extrusion. All right, so I think that uh, pretty much we're, we're wrapped up here at this point. Uh, is there, are there any other closing comments that you guys would like to uh, make before we end our, um, our webinar? I, I saw that there was another question come in, but I just wanted to thank everybody for their time. Yeah. I know that these things can get a little boring. We're hopefully we were somewhat entertaining. <laughs> Be easy on us. Be easy on us. Yeah, entertaining and informative. That's the important thing. That's, that's the whole idea behind this series. So. All right. Well, thank you guys very much, and um, 
until next time, we'll have uh, plenty more to come uh, up next year. Wonderful. Can't wait for the next subject. Take care. Got it. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.